Praise God. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them how much you appreciate them. Don't lie now. Don't lie. God bless you. Appreciate you, Chris. You may be seated. Hey, man, I'm going to do some teaching tonight. My wife says treat, which is teach and preach at the same time. So we'll see how it goes. But <clears throat> um, I want to kind of follow up on Sunday morning. I taught on baptism in... Uh, I started studying this remission and the importance of it. Where does remission, how, does, how is that important to have your sins remitted? How is that so important? And how is, that, uh, how is the application of remission applied? So, that sounds like a complicated question, but let me... Uh, dig into it here and, and I, I might spread some light on something you may not understand. How many know uh, where death first came into the Bible? Garden. Garden. Say it loud, I'm deaf. Garden. Garden. Who died? The animal. An animal died. The Bible says in Genesis 3.21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. The Bible says, in the day that thou sinnest, thou shalt surely die. The first place that mercy was applied was by God in the garden to Adam and Eve. <clears throat> because instead of killing them, he killed an animal, made their skins into coats, and made them for a covering. So, the, the institution of blood covering sin, or death covering sin, was started in the garden for Adam and Eve. That set the groundwork, as it were. God does everything, uh, and, and we have the benefit of looking back in hindsight. How many know it's easier to see everything in hindsight? I can't see tomorrow. Matter of fact, I'm really tired right now. I'd love to just sleep in. But that alarm clock's going to go off at 5.10. I'm going to have to get up. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen tomorrow because my boss is in town. Anything can happen. When he leaves town, I'll be happy because then I know, you know, we're good. But as long as I don't know tomorrow, all I can do is look back. And in hindsight, it's 2020 or 2015. So we're looking in hindsight at what God does. So trying to understand why we do things now, we look in hindsight and in the principles and practices that the Bible had put into place. Why blood? I always wondered, why blood? Now, I knew. In recent years, I've understood that. But when I was younger, I was like, man, why does everybody have to die? Why, why? Because sin brings forth death. The Lord said, in the day they sin, you shall die. So, instead of man dying, God always makes a way of escape for man, especially if you're willing to obey. Um, Ezekiel 18 and 20. It said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquities of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquities of the son. The, righteous, <clears throat> the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So if you move past the garden, you move into the relationship uh, of Cain and Abel. They inst the Lord instituted sacrifice. Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. It was vegetables. No blood. Nothing really died. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. It was a lamb. It was the pattern of things God had set up in the garden. Now, to me, uh, Moses prescribed the sacrifice of a lamb. So I'm assuming that the Lord saw the sheep. He probably was just minding his own business there in the garden. And the Lord looked down and said, you make a nice jacket. Snap. You got a fur coat, baby. So, but that's the principle that was set into place in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 
in the Old Testament speaks of a new relationship because the Bible said that the sins of the fathers would go to the third generation. But Ezekiel saying, the Lord's not going to deal with man that way. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquities of the father. So God has transitioned through time his relationship with man. And sometimes we forget God is merciful. You're here by mercy. You're here by His grand design, but it's the mercies of God that we were not destroyed. Right. It's His mercy that He looked down uh, 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 2,000 years ago and said, Matt Monroe's going to need a way to survive. Because sin brings forth death. The Bible says we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. There's no getting around who you are because we're sinners. Romans 3.25 these are, this is the pattern whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. This is Jesus. To declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. This is a very unique scripture in that it reaches back into the Old Testament and describes God's nature as one of forbearance. God never wanted to destroy man, but God is as good as His word. He was just like my dad. My, my dad said I was getting a spanking. I don't care how long the day went through. I don't care if we went and had ice cream. We had a picnic. I washed the car. At some point before I went to bed, he tanned my eye. He was good as his word. If he woke up at 6 in the morning, I did something. He said, you're getting a spanking? You're getting a spanking. God is as good as his word. But his mercy, his mercy supersedes his, his own desire for justice because he has forbearance for mankind. Not for the wicked. God does not forbear wickedness. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But his mercy, especially when there is a sacrifice. I was reading in the Old Testament and there were prescribed sacrifices for different sins. So if you, if you did this, you did that. If you had this other problem, you had to do this. And there was a, a prescription, but there was an allowance made for the poor. So if you didn't have the money to buy a goat or a, a lamb, God could allow you to buy a turtle dove. Or there was a prescription because God's forbearance was not to kill man. He could have did that in the garden and none of us would be here and the story would be over. But he didn't. He looked at the lamb and said, you're going to be a jacket today. God's forbearance looks out for us. So when you talk about remission of sin, you don't you have to get you have to understand the concept. God doesn't only forgive you, he removes sin from you. So instead of Adam and Eve dying that day, God removed them from death. He's as good as his word though. They needed a sacrifice or they would die. So we know they did sacrifices because Cain and Abel sacrificed and they were the children of Adam and Eve. So they got the principle somewhere the Lord had the conversation. You move forward in time and, and throughout the entire Old Testament God is getting more merciful because man has become so sinful. By the time you get to Ezekiel all, of, all the curses of the Old Testament have passed. Most of the judgment of the Old Testament has passed. And God is reaching toward man with mercy. He is giving promise. You get into Isaiah. And it says, uh, uh, for us, uh, uh, 9 and 6 says, For unto us of sons born. Anyway, I can't quote it right this second. So, how are you? Not that far. For unto us a child is born, unto us there it is. Son is given. Yep. And the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Counselor, my God. Okay, let's be. So, He's pointing, man. Woohoo! Hang on there. It's, it's, it's on the screen. That's right. Oh, you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Chris. Thank <laughs> you. How we do it? Next time, point. It's almost brain. So, God has always, always had mercy on man. He's always let man out of punishment because of his mercy. But when the blood was applied, there became a remittance of sin. 
It's one thing for, for you to have your taxes paid by somebody else. It's one thing to have your taxes erased. <laughs> Somebody you should shout. You're that tag record. We need to shout. Jesus. <laughs> so when sin is remitted, it's different than sin that is just forgiven. So the importance of remission comes into play. Because I would rather have my sins remitted, that is, washed away, wiped away, blotted out. I can go through a, a, a hundred different examples of what the Lord said in the New Testament. The old, uh, uh, Isaiah, the first chapter, said, Come unto me, uh, uh, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them as wool. As crimson, I'll make them as snow. Did he throw it up there again? <laughs> Just checking. I misquoted, they'll see it, brother. So, there was always a point where the Lord was reaching to man, trying to do for man what man could not do for himself. How many know that we fight to get to God, not because God is resisting us? I don't fight the Lord. I don't wake up and say, Lord, let's, let's, let's duke it out. It's not me. I, fly, I look in the mirror and I said, oh, I am tied to a body of death. The problem is right between this ear and this ear. It's nowhere else. So, for me to get to God is so easy. We battle to get to God. What are we battling? Nobody's stopping you. But we're, we can't understand the process of, of salvation and forgiveness. And how can God blot my sins out? He don't know who I am and what I've done. Well, yes, He does. That's why He did. We don't deserve His mercy. We don't reserve uh, we don't. We don't deserve remission of sin. We don't even. For, we don't even deserve forgiveness. You know what the difference between remission and forgiveness is? It's between your parents just letting it go. What do we do again? That's forgiveness. Remit is when they get down there and they cry and they bawl. It's not with you and tell you it's okay, baby. We're going to get through this together. And we'll get on the other side and we're not. There's more of a relationship when somebody wipes it clean. You with me? Jesus put it this way. And, it, and when I read this, it all just kind of coalesced. I thought, how can this be? This is the Lord, Matthew 26, 26. He's with his disciples. They're having communion. Do a little foot wash. This is communion part. And he said, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. And said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sin. So, the Lord puts a, he puts the pieces of remission together. He frameworks it in a pattern of together. We're no longer apart. We're together. We're sitting at a table. We're sharing a meal. We're being intimate. We're being fellows. We're, we're close together. There's a close... Why? Because when sin's not remitted, there's always distance between you and somebody else. How many love the person that just cut them off? How about that lady in the line that got the last Black Friday special and looked at you and, and walked away with it? Oh, God, I'm killing right now. You don't know what I'm saying. See, offense keeps us separate. But God, He put this remission in a framework of absolute closeness and uniqueness. It's a, we're sharing remit, Remittance of sin is not just us, me forgiving you. It's a closeness. It's a your sins are forgiven. That means what you used to be, you're no longer that. The, the marks you had are wiped away. What you walked in at is not how you're going to walk out. The relationship has changed. Now we're sitting together in fellowship and in closeness. We're in the context of sin that has been completely wiped out. You're no longer who you were. You're living a, a lifetime of sins that have been remitted.
Hebrews 19 puts a whole picture together of blood sacrifice and remission. Hebrews 19 and 9, if you put it up there, I'll read. There isn't 19. <laughs> Hebrews only goes to 13. What's that? Hebrews only goes to 13. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 19. I'm dyslexic. <laughs> 9.19 Hebrews 9.19 For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And almost all things by the law are purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now listen to this. He took the blood of the calves, the sacrifice, and the goats, mixed it with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled it upon all those that were listening to his words. They were sanctified by the water and the blood. It came, it brought them into a covenant relationship because God saw the water and the blood. The water was the washing, the blood was the sacrifice. And when God saw those Israelites, they were in covenant with Him. Now they're not, they're not, you're not just somebody I know. You're in covenant with me. It's like being married. You're not, we're not just friends anymore. Now we're in covenant. We're married. Your, your sins are remitted. You're right here with me. You, there's a covering of blood, a washing of water. This is good stuff. That's why it says in the 22, it says, almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shed of blood. There is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. He was referring to the remission of the sin of the Old Testament was just killing a calf. But the remission of the blood of the New Testament was one of a perfect man living and his blood shedding. So where is that blood applied? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. I have to have water. My lips will no longer open. Turn to your neighbor and say, get a drink, brother. Get a drink, brother. We had um, Mexican food with a wonderful couple right before church. I'm up here burping the most delicious flavors. I'm enjoying my dinner twice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I had to wash it back down. I know none of you do that, okay? None of you heard. So, where's the blood applied? How do we get into covenant with Jesus? And I don't have time to get into all this, but Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you. This is the washing. That's right. The washing. In the name of Jesus Christ, this is the sacrifice. You have the washing by water. And when you apply the name of Jesus Christ, you apply the sacrifice. The sacrifice was applied by Moses when he mingled the water and the blood. And he sprinkled everything. That was, that was a significant act where remission was applied to all the people. In the New Testament, you, Jesus would not have enough blood to sprinkle 2,000 years of people. I don't think... But in His name, when we go down into the waters of baptism and we're in His name, remission is applied. How do you know remission is applied? Because it says, it says, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin. So when is sin remitted? When the blood is applied. When is the blood applied? In baptism. So when I go down into Jesus' name, not only does my old man die, 
But when I come up, I come up in covenant with Jesus. I'm covered with his blood. And when Jesus sees me, he don't see the old man of sin. He sees the new man born in a new way, in a new body, covered in his blood. And I'll, let me tell you something about the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, uh, in, in uh, I can't put it right now, I didn't put it in there that time. But there's a scripture where it says, the blotting out of the ordinances against us. You have to understand, in the Old Testament, when they blotted something out, they used ink that would blot out. You could not see what it was. So there was some writing. If they blotted you out, you couldn't even you couldn't lift it up and hold it to the light. There's why? Because it was blotted out. The blood of Jesus doesn't just cover; it marks out your transgression, as if it wasn't even there. So when when the angel of the Lord opens the book of your life and begins to look at the pages, you know what he sees? He sees the blood of Jesus. He don't see nothing but the blood of Jesus. So when you're in repentance and you're in covenant, when I mess up, I go back to Jesus and I get some more blood. How much blood does he got? How much sin do you have? I serve a God that can do anything. There's nothing God can't bring you back from. You can be a murderer and God can get you to heaven. Now you may die in a death chamber somewhere. You might die in prison in old age for, for the crime you, you committed. But friend, your soul can be redeemed by God. Paul was murdered. Yep. I love the Bible. You can come up with any excuse why you can't live for God. And I can show you something that did. That's right. That's right. I can show you. I mean, you can come up with two men. You don't know where I've been. Look, I can tell you where some of these folks have been. And it wasn't pretty. Okay. And yet they came right to Jesus' feet. And he touched them, go, and sent them. This woman whose sins were many. He didn't, he didn't make a remark of don't worry about what she did. He, he admitted, though her sins be many, now they are forgiven. Right. Right. The Pharisees got all mad. Thank you, brother. The Pharisees get all mad. You know why? Because they cannot forgive sin. There's no man on this earth that can help you. Period. That's right. Man can't save me. I've said this before. If it's your turn to go, all the armies of the world could not save you. Amen. But if, it, if it's not your turn to go, all the armies of the world could not take you. But when we have Jesus and we have the blood, there's no moment of life where you're not in a relationship, in a covenant that brings everything to the table that God has for you. When you have the blood in your life and you have repentance in your life and you have a relationship with Him, look, my wife got everything I've got. My children are going to get whatever's left if I don't spend it. Why? Because they're blood. They're in covenant. Their relationship. That's how close we are. The Bible says we are sons of God. We are children of God. The earnest of our inheritance is, is God coming and covering our sin, filling us with the Holy Ghost. That's the earnest. That's just like a, a little down payment. Look, this, just taste this and see what I've done for you here. Because that's just, a, a, you're not, you can't even understand what I got for you in heaven. You're going to go to sleep one day and wake up the next day. Your eyes are going to be looking at uh, eternity and you're going to say, my God, this must be heaven. You know when you're there. No one's going to have to tell you you're in heaven. You're going to wake up and I'm in heaven. How do you know? Because I ain't no place anywhere like this. We know what hell's going to be like. We got a little glimpse of heaven. But friend, when you're in covenant with God, you're in a relationship that is not one-sided. You ever love somebody and feel like they walk away? Pour out trying your eyes to give and make you feel like they walk away. You get disappointed. But with Jesus, for he ain't going anywhere. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He loves you more than you love you. That's got me a lot of love. He's looking out for us, and we were even with the Bensons, and we were just talking back and forth, kind of really encouraging each other. I was getting all hyped up, and they were, and I was kind of crying. We were just having a good time. Why? Because when you start talking about Jesus and all that he has done for you, right. there should be a swelling in your heart. That something should get a hold of you. Man, I've got the blood. If I was living in a little trailer back of 
a church and I just had a, just, a, just one pair of change of clothes and a ride a moped everywhere because that's all I had. But if I got Jesus, right. I got more than the world could ever have. Jesus. I went to bed with my mind on Jesus. 
and I woke up with my mind on Jesus. Right. You know what that does to your confidence when you wake up in the morning and you realize my mind is still on Jesus. That's why I believe you can pray anytime you want. But I'm telling you this. If you pray in the morning before anybody wakes up, you just get in there and get in. You don't have to pray for seven hours. You have to lay it naked with your belly. Uh, lay on your belly, you know. You know I pray for this, believe me. I want you to get a visual of a whale down there in front of the Lord. I'm laying out for the Lord. Oh, God, don't do that. When you're laying there praying, and we got tears in your eyes, and not tears from crying. Honey, come up and play. I think I've done lost it here. When you get up in the morning, can I get a restart? Can we go back a minute? So when you get up in the morning fully dressed, you walk into the in your, where you pray. If you will concentrate your mind, how many know when you pray you can think about anything? How many know when you pray you're usually uh, ten miles off before you realize why in the world am I thinking about buying a barbecue? Your brain, I mean, you you'll be oh Jesus, I need you. I'd love to have a red. I mean, it's like that, what's that car, That cartoon where it's a squirrel? Squirrel. Sometimes when you're praying, it isn't like squirrel, squirrel. It's, it's, you have to train your mind. When you pray, you train your mind. You bring every thought into captivity. I pray out loud, you know why? Because when I'm praying out loud, it makes my mind focus on what I'm saying. And as I'm praying out loud and I'm focused on what I'm saying, I'm realizing what I'm saying, because you need to know what you say to God in prayer, so that when He does what you ask in prayer, you remember that you prayed about that. I'm telling you, when you pray and you talk to God and you hear yourself praying, go ahead and play something, huh? Let's stand. When you pray and you're sincere and you use your mind and your mouth and your body, I have a whole little routine I do in prayer, but it keeps my mind focused on prayer. I don't want to sit somewhere and take a 30 minute wander in my mind. I want to focus my thoughts. I, I have needs. I have things I got to get to God. And the more you learn to concentrate, the easier prayer becomes. I'm not bragging. I just use these for examples, okay? The other morning that I got really early and I finished reading one of my books and I went in to pray and I was praying and all of a sudden I heard a little girl in there start getting up moving around. And I reached over here at my phone and looked at it, and it was 619. I had started praying at 525, and it felt like two minutes. I thought, my God, you can get into a spirit of prayer. And, and I didn't even feel like I had everything out that I needed to pray about. I didn't feel like I had enough time talking to God, but I had to go to work. So in my mind, I'm thinking, man. If I can get with God and just get intense enough, it doesn't take an hour. It doesn't take 20 minutes. It just takes focused prayer. Billy Cole said it best, and I'm closing with this. Billy Cole said it best. He's, I, somebody went up to Brother Billy Cole and I said, he said, Billy Cole, how do you pray before you go into these conferences? He was uh, had been in uh, Ethiopia at a conference preaching and there was a group of over 200,000 people. The picture that you see from the platform is a sea of people. A sea of people. They have a little brush harbor where about 10,000 people are covered. And then it's a sea as far as you can see in the picture of people. Just tens of thousands of people. And they asked, and, and when he had that service, 100,000 people got the Holy Ghost. And someone said, how, how did that happen? Shit, 
I get in covenant. I maintain a relationship with him. And when I need him, he's just a prayer of pain. When I was having my stroke, the only thing I could say really good was, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. And I tell you, God comes in and you need him. Amen. Amen. This is not this adult. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. We'll see you on Friday night. God bless you.